Hello and welcome to the Broken Sword. Today we are having a look at the Dwarf of the Fellowship of the Ring, Gimli. Gimli, son of Glowin. The dwarf who was one of the three hunters, who was one of the nine walkers of the Fellowship of the Ring, who was a part of a couple of amazing feats that no other dwarf would ever match. So, I believe that this dwarf is truly worthy of a full story video. So, let's jump into it. Gimli was born in the year 2879 of the Third Age in the Blue Mountains in the western lands of Middle-earth, to his father Glowin who you may well recognise as one of the 13 dwarves who were a part of Thorin's company on the quest of Erebor, and along with him, a mother that we never learn anything of, just like really any of the dwarven women who are left forever in mystery. Gimli was a member of the line of Durin's folk, so descended from Durin himself, who is the father of one of the seven families of the dwarves who first came to be. With this family being descendants of the legendary Durin, who was the eldest of these fathers, and therefore the first ever dwarf to come to be. He was in fact also the dwarf to found the realm of Khazad Dûm, and quite obviously also the first king of Durin's folk. However, a full video on the origins of the dwarven race is really one that deserves its own video, so please leave me a comment below of Fathers of the Dwarves if you would like to see that video made. But anyway, now moving on. The dwarves of the Lonely Mountain had been attacked by the dragon Smaug in the year 2770 of the Third Age, so at this point, these members of Durin's folk had been in exile for just over a hundred years, meaning, in the early years of Gimli's life, he never had the chance to set eyes on the halls of Erebor like his father had before him. And by the time that Gimli had turned 62, it was time for Thorin Oakenshield to form Thorin's company and set off on the quest of Erebor in an attempt to reclaim the kingdom under the mountain. However, as much as Gimli may have wished it, he was not allowed to go himself on this mission as it is stated in the book of the unfinished tales of Numenor and Middle-earth. It still sounds absurd, he said, even now that all has turned out more than well. I knew Thorin, of course and I wish I had been there, but I was away at the time of your first visit to us, and I was not allowed to go on the quest. Too young, they said, though at 62 I thought myself fit for anything. Well, I am glad to have heard the full tale. If it is full, I do not really suppose that even now you are telling us all you know. Of course not, said Gandalf. And so, after their success in removing Smaug and the chaos of the Battle of Five Armies in 2941, Gimli would reunite with his father Glowin as he was now first able to set his eyes upon the Halls of Erebor, and then he would stay here for the coming years. In fact, Gimli would be in Erebor at the time that this messenger of Sauron would come to the doors of Erebor. Now, it is unknown exactly who or what this messenger was, but a lot of people presume that it may well have been one of the Nazgul. However, if Sauron had not wished to send something so obviously evil, maybe it was just an evil man, or someone like the mouth of Sauron. We don't really know, but regardless of what this being was, this messenger began questioning about a certain hobbit called Bilbo Baggins, who it was known that he was friendly with the dwarves of Thorin's company. This messenger would offer the temptation of the return of the Dwarven Rings of Power to King Dane in return for this information. This information is revealed to the Council of Alrond by Glowin, and it was this messenger who was part of the reason that Glowin and Gimli were sent to make the journey to Rivendell to seek the Council of Alrond. After all, this messenger had returned on three separate occasions for an answer, but each time he left without the information that he had hoped for. So now, Gimli is sat in the Council of Elrond, learning all about the One Ring, of Sauron, and of much of the past. This is where he comes to join the Fellowship of the Ring, and sets off as a part of the company on December 25th, 3018 of the Third Age, as one of the Nine Walkers to contrast the Nine Nazgul. As they left, it is said that Gimli wore openly a shirt of steel rings, for dwarves make light of burdens, and in his belt was a broad-bladed axe. 
It did not take long into their journey for Gimli to show his worth and knowledge to the company, with his understanding of the Misty Mountains, especially impressing Samwise Gamgee. I need no map, said Gimli who had come up with Legolas and was gazing out before him with a strange light in his deep eyes. There is the land where our fathers worked of old, and we have wrought the image of those mountains into many works of metal and of stone, and into many songs and tales. They stand tall in our dreams, Baraz, Zirak, Satur, only once before have I seen them from afar in waking life, but I know them in their names, for under them lies Khazadu, the Dwarodalf, that is now called the Black Pit, Moria in the Alvish tongue. Yonder stands Barazinbar, the Red Horn, Krol Karadras, and beyond him the Silvertine and Cloudy Head, Kalebdil the White, and Fuidol the Grey, that we call Siragzigil and Bundushatur. There the misty mountains divide, and between their arms lies the deep shadowed valley which we cannot forget, Azanul Bizar, the Dimrel Dale, which the owls call Nandu Hirion. This knowledge of the mountains and expected curiosity of the quest of Balin led to Gimli having some strong opinions when it came to the solution of not being able to pass over the Pass of Karadras, with there even being a smouldering fire in his eyes when the first mentioning of taking the way of the Mines of Moria was uttered by Gandalf. As in fact here, it was Balin's quest into Moria that was the other main reason for him and his father Glowin to make for Rivendell and seek Auron's counsel. In the end though, this path appears to be the only one that they could take, and so they reached the doors of Durin on the western side to try and find the secret entrance. In fact, it is here we hear the first disagreement between Legolas and Gimli on the matter of the relationship between elves and dwarves. It was not the fault of the dwarves that the friendship waned, said Gimli. I have not heard it was the fault of the elves, said Legolas. I have heard both, said Gandalf. <laughs> Again though, the origins to the souring of this relationship is definitely worth its own video, so that subject is again one to cover another day. But anyway, Gimli was a great help to Gandalf in solving the mystery of the hidden dwarven doors, and so Gandalf wished for Gimli to walk in front with him as they made their way through the dark tunnels and passages under the mountain. Gimli would give counsel throughout when Gandalf was unsure of which direction they should take as despite never having set foot in this kingdom himself, the dwarves had a keen sense for the architecture of their people. The company would come to reach the chamber of Mazarbal, with Gimli being the first of his people to learn the true fate of Balin and his company. As the fellowship were attacked here, Gimli would use the wrath of the dwarves to protect Balin's tomb and help them escape. When the Balrog made its appearance, it would be Gimli who would lead the others over the bridge of khazad and out of the eastern gate. Despite the feeling the Fellowship were being chased out of Moria, Gimli insisted he must go and set his own eyes upon Keled Zoram, also known by the name of Miramir, which is the lake that is located near to the eastern gate of khazad in the southeast corner of the Dimrel Dale. This was a very important location to the dwarves of Jurin's folk, as it was this lake that Jurin the First had reached after he had awoke at Mount Gundabad, where he saw a crown of stars above his head after looking into the water, and this confirmed to Jurin that it was a sign that this was where to found the realm for his people. When Gimli goes, he would only take Frodo with him when going to look at the lake, and when they stared into the water, they would both witness Jurin's crown in its reflection. Now the company had escaped the dwarven realms of the Mines of Moria, their next stop was to make their way into the elven realm of Lothlorien. However here, Gimli would be far less keen to be helpful, as when a group of elves led by Haldir found the group on their borders, they demanded that as a dwarf, Gimli must be blindfolded before being led within. However, Gimli refused to be subjected to such embarrassment in the end, they came to a mutual agreement that all members of the Fellowship, even Legolas, would be blindfolded so the suffering would not solely be aimed at Gimli. However, when Galadriel heard of their approach, she ordered for all blindfolds to be removed, including Gimli's. Now within Lothlorien, Gimli would begin to feel something that few dwarves had felt in many, many a year, an infatuation towards an elf. As Gimli would become infatuated by Galadriel after she showed sympathy towards him and even used traditional Kuzdal words that few outside their race would even know, let alone use. 
After all, the secret language of the dwarves, called Kuzdal, was just that. A well-guarded secret known generally just amongst themselves, generally just used for books and for lore that they had no intention in sharing with anyone else. In fact, one of the only known phrases from this is a very core cool battle cry of Baruch Khazad, Khazad i Menu, meaning Axes of the Dwarves, the Dwarves are upon you. A really amazing battle cry, I must say. But anyway, going back to Gimli and Galadriel. A powerful moment happened between the two as the Fellowship was getting ready to set out from Lothlorien, as Galadriel was giving each member of the company a gift. And when it came to Gimli, he asked her for one simple thing, a single strand of hair from her head. You may be thinking of this though, that it's actually a little bit straight, but the meaning behind it is important. And okay, again here, I feel like I've said this a couple times too many in this video today, but again, this subject is worthy of its own video, but I will summarize it quickly here for you. If we go back to the time of Feanor, the one time king of the Noldor, who was considered the greatest of all the Noldor, he had asked Galadriel for a similar gift all those thousands of years before, but she rejected him. However, for Gimli, she gave him three hairs with a blessing of goodwill, a mighty difference in her reaction. And this overwhelmed Gimli and their departure too. And so, after going into Lothlorien, being at odds with the owls, he now left being held in high regard by the Lady of Lorien, and now also great friends with Legolas too. The Fellowship would continue their journey down the Anduin, reaching Nenhithuel, and this would be where the Fellowship would break. Frodo and Sam would leave to take the ring to Mordor with just the two of them, Merry and Pippin would be captured by Saruman's Urukai and orcs, and Boromir would be slain in his attempt to defend them. This left Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli to decide what path to follow next. They chose to not give up on Merry and Pippin, and thus the three hunters were formed. Thanks to Aragorn's great trekking skills, they followed the Uruk's trail into the plains of Rohan, even coming across a dropped Alvin brooch left by Pippin at the hope that someone might be following them. Although the three hunters followed the Uruk's with all their might, they could feel the will of Saruman giving great need to the Uruk's while slowing them down. As their hope was starting to dwindle, they came across Eomir and his Eoret, who informed them of a group of orcs that they had slaughtered on the edge of Fangorn not that long before and there even came close to being a duel between Gimli and Eomir after Eomir called Galadriel a netweaver and sorcerer, with Legolas even defending his friend here as well, an impossible thought not too long before. Aragorn calmed all this down though, and the three hunters were given two horses to go and inspect the orcs that they had killed. They reached the edge of Fangorn and inspected the area, but needed to wait for the next light of day to be able to search properly. As they camped, Gimli was shocked to suddenly see in the night what he thought was an old bent man leaning on his staff on the edge of the tree. Gimli's quick motion woke Aragorn and Legolas, but as they went to approach the old man, he disappeared without a trace. A very strange occurrence that really shook Gimli. As light came the next day, they discovered signs that in fact Merry and Pippin were alive and had gone into Fangle. But when they followed these signs, it was not the hobbits that they found, but instead Gandalf the White. Gandalf would join the three hunters here and they would make their way to Edoras, the capital of Rohan. When reaching the halls of King Theoden, Gimli would hear an insult aimed at Galadriel once again, this time from Wormtum, but Gandalf would manage to calm him here. In fact, after riding with the people of Rohan to Helm's Deep, Gimli would turn impressed by the fortress that he saw, believing that if it was the dwarves that lived here that they could make this fortress invincible. But there were no dwarves except that of our Gimli. So, when the time came for the Battle of the Hornburg, it was just men alongside Legolas and Gimli. It was this battle that would start the good hearted battle of the kill counts between these two friends. And for Gimli, there would not just be glory kills, for his impact on the battle was essential. At one point, he saved the life of Eomir. He heroically leapt from the walls to stop a sneak attack, and he blocked the small passage and kept guard of it. There would also be a moment mid-battle that would change the rest of Gimli's life too, as at one point the defenders of Helm's Deep were forced back into the glittering caves and the Hornburg, 
with the glittering caves being an awe-inspiring jeweled cave system that lay inside the White Mountains behind Helm's Deep, and the Hornburg being the main fortress section of Helm's Deep, not including the Great Deeping Wall. Now, when Gimli first witnessed these caves, he could not believe his eyes, and this section shows it in the way he describes it afterwards to Legolas. No dwarf could be unmoved by such loveliness. None of Durin's race would mine those caves for stones or ore, not if diamonds and gold could be got there. Do you cut down groves of blossoming trees in the springtime for firewood? We would tend these glades of flowering stone, not quarry them. With cautious skill, tap by tap, a small chip of rock and no more, perhaps, in a whole anxious day. So we could work, and as the years went by, we should open up new ways and display far chambers that are still dark, glimpsed only as a void beyond fissures in rock. And lights, Legolas, we should make lights, such lamps as once shone in Khazad Doom. And when we wished we would drive away the night that has lain there since the hills were made, and when we desired rest, we would let the night return. Now, as the Battle of Hornburg concluded, Gimli was happy to hear he in fact beat Legolas in their kill counts by one, despite at one point being 20 kills to two down. But now, the victors move on and travel to Isengard, where the three hunters are reunited with the hobbits, Merry and Pippin. It is a great sight for their tired eyes that their exhausting journey had not been in vain. However, it is not just the hobbits they are here for, as Saruman the wizard was still in Orthanc. Here, Gimli shows the hardiness of the dwarves. We already know a little of it with how the dwarves were not corrupted by the rings of power in the same way that the men were, but here we get a first-hand example. Saruman uses the power of his voice to try and sway King Theoden and the men of Rohan to forgive him and let him free, but Gimli is unmoved by this attempt to sway them, saying how no word that comes out of his mouth can be trusted. This in fact breaks Saruman's spell for a moment, with him being almost in shock that this dwarf could resist him, and in turn this breaks the charm he's trying to put on everyone else. Saruman's Isengard is then left under the command of the Ents, and he is left in his tower. As the heroes of the Battle of the Hornburg split up, the three hunters remain together, as Gimli had grown such love and respect for Aragorn that he did not wish to part just yet when the war was still ongoing. Gimli would follow Aragorn to the paths of the dead. This was a moment that truly tested Gimli, for when they reached the Gate of the Debt beneath the White Mountains, Gimli really wished to not carry on. Then Legolas laid his hands on his eyes and sang some words that went soft in the gloom, until he suffered himself to be led, and Legolas passed in. And there stood Gimli the Dwarf, left all alone. His knees shook, and he was wroth with himself. Here is a thing unheard of, he said, an elf will go underground, and a dwarf dare not. With that he plunged in, but it seemed to him that he dragged his feet like lead over the threshold, and at once a blindness came upon him, even upon Gimli, Glowin's son, who had walked unafraid in many deep places of the world. I really quite enjoy that passage, as it is very true that sometimes a healthy rivalry between friends can really help push each other along. And so, Gimli completed the journey through the pass of the debt, Aragorn summoned the dead to fulfil their oath and they drove away the Corsairs at Pelagia. The three hunters, the sons of Aurond, Eladan and Aurohir, the Grey Company and the reinforcements from the southern fiefdoms now took the black ships and sailed north to Minas Tirith and the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. This group of reinforcements turned the tide of the battle, caught the enemy between the hammer and anvil of theirs and Aomir's forces and brought victory to the men of the west. The war was not over yet though, as Gimli followed Aragorn again to the Black Gates of Mordor and fought in the Battle of Morannon in March of 3019. The idea of this move was for Sauron to think that Aragorn had taken the One Ring and now wished to overthrow Sauron in Mordor, so that they could create a distraction for Frodo and Sam. The bait was taken and the battle swelled, but once the dust had settled, Gimli remained unharmed. The bond that Gimli had created with all of those that he had set out from Rivendell with was now so great that he knew he would never forget any single one of them. Now, Middle-earth moved into the time of more peace, and Aragorn could be crowned the King of Gondor in May of 3019. 
Gimli and Aomir settled their initial disagreement too, with Aomir begging Gimli's pardon for his words he spoke against Galadriel. Despite saying this though, he still did not think that she was the fairest in the lands, but when he said that he believed this instead to be Arwen, Gimli could accept it. At some point during the beginning of the cleanup of Middle Earth, Aragorn had ordered for the restoration of Orthanc, and with a big thanks to Gimli, secrets were discovered. Saruman in his degradation had become not a dragon, but a jackdaw. At last, behind a hidden door that they could not have found or opened had not Elisar had the aid of Gimli the Dwarf, a steel closet was revealed. Maybe it had been intended to receive the ring, but it was almost bare. In a casket on a high shelf two things were laid. One was a small case of gold, attached to a fine chain. It was empty, and bore no letter or token. But beyond all doubt it had once borne the ring around Isildur's neck. Now. With no more wars to fight, Legolas and Gimli carried on with their travels together. During their adventures they had agreed, Gimli would return to Fangorn with Legolas, if Legolas would return to the glittering caves with Gimli. And so, after their journeys, Gimli would then return to a war ravaged Erebor, discovering that King Dane Ironfoot had fallen in the wars in the north defending his people. So now Thorin Stonehelm III was king here instead. Gimli would not stay here for too great a time though, as he wished once again to return to the Glittering Caves, this time with a group of dwarves to set up a colony, and here he would gain the title of Lord of the Glittering Caves. Gimli would work closely with the realms of Rohan and Gondor during his time here, and accomplish many great works, with the most famous of these being the rebuilding of the gates of Minas Tirith that had been broken by Grond during the war and he would build these new gates with the use of both mithril and steel. Also, while spending this time in Minas Tirith, he would reunite once again with the hobbits Merry and Pippin, where he would pass on information about his people so that they could be included into the Red Book of Westmarch. This is a small little thing that can perhaps be understated, as we have quickly mentioned before, the dwarves were so secretive about everything of their histories, lore and their race, so for then Gimli to pass this information on to the hobbits is truly a changing of times. Not much else is known of the rest of Gimli's life though, except that he lived until a good old age, when in the year 120 of the fourth age he would move on, and this is noted in appendix B of the Lord of the Rings. In this year on March 1st came at last the passing of King Elisar. It is said that the beds of Meriadoc and Peregrine were set beside the bed of the great king. Then Legolas built a grey ship in Athelion, and sailed down the Anduin, and so over the sea, and with him, it is said, went Gimli the dwarf, and when that ship passed an end was come in Middle-earth, of the fellowship of the ring. And so passed on over the sea the only dwarf to ever take that path, Gimli son of Glowin one of the nine walkers of the Fellowship of the Ring, the Lord of the Glittering Caves. Gimli is truly one of the greatest dwarves to have ever set foot in Middle-earth. He repaired bridges that had been burned so long before, created strong bonds of friendship and made an almighty impact in the War of the Ring, even if sometimes his achievements go a little under the radar. It is hard to argue that he is not one of the greatest dwarves to have ever lived. And so, from here, I will ask you all my question for the day, and that is, do you agree with me that Gimli is one of the greatest of his race to have ever existed, or do you think there are actually many others who deserve this recognition instead? If he doesn't deserve it to you, then would he even make it into a top 5 or a top 10 for example? Let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. Now quickly to finish off, I'd like to remind you all we do have our other channels so please check those out, links of course will be in the description below, and also it's time to shout out our patron. Firstly our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Abra, Matt and Glorfindel of Gondolin, you are all awesome, and a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheath, Denver Steel and Gregory, and as well I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew and Pirate747. Every single one of you patrons is a true legend of the bro hero. Finally, if you're not already as well, please all the great stuff. Hit that like button on the video, leave us a comment too, share the video if you really enjoyed it. All of these things really help us out with the YouTube algorithm and really we just cannot thank you enough if you do so. So 
Once again, I will say thank you if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.